some detail. But used, mostly the questions do not demand much detailing. Right? They do not demand much detailing, much recalling. They should be simple to answer if you have understood and you have the concept. It should be easy to answer. About the... Uh, what was the other thing? The cases. Yes. You have just three cases uploaded on the e-learning. Three cases of bacteriology. I think one is from something, childhood brucella, and one is... Syphilis. Childhood syphilis, and one is... Uh, Skin disease, endocarditis, following eczema or something like that. So you will have questions only from these. And the questions will be not a sort of a recalling or asking about some facts. They would be about the concept that you gain after reading and understanding these cases. So not much of a problem. Anything else? No. This I'm talking about the mid course, and we'll deal with the finals later on. No SAQs in the mid course, only MCQs. That's it. Yes. We're going to talk about two <coughs> two diseases. One is babesiosis, and the other one is the dengue fever. Both can cause what? Hmm? No pointer here. Babesiosis will take up first. Babesiosis is actually a, a, a disease which is not very widespread in the in the world. It is uh, mostly it is present in some parts of the United States and some parts of Europe. We have to study it because we have to study everything which is related to the United States. This is our problem, and sometimes maybe you people have to go for your uh, uh, higher studies to to the United States. So you might come across this condition. I don't think you have had any case reported in Saudi Arabia. It is caused by an organism yeah. which is called Babesia microti. This organism is somewhat like the malaria parasite, and it is related to malaria parasite as far as the um, life cycle and some sort of shape is concerned. It is quite similar to malaria parasite, but the difference is that it is transmitted by these ticks and not by the mosquito. It is transmitted by the ticks, exodes ticks, and it is endemic in the rodents. The jungle cycle is going on between the ticks and the rodents. But when the, once the man comes in between, and uh, you know, then the ticks they start considering the man as a rodent and they start biting it, and the man develops the disease. The man is you know, fond of taking so much risks going into the jungles and going into the habitats where these things are. So the, uh, you know, the, the disease presence in man is accidental and it is not the natural uh, way of existing of this parasite. The man doesn't come in the life cycle of the parasite. Now, it will infect the It infects the RBCs and brings about the lysis of the uh, RBCs. And once the RBCs are lysed, what happens? Anemia. Anemia. Yeah, there is hemolysis, there is breakdown, there is release of the iron, there is uh, loss of iron, deposition of iron in the tissues. 
resulting clinically in, in anemia and other effects of hemolysis. Not only anemia, other effects of hemolysis are also there. Then you have trophozytes and merozytes, <clears throat> just the same trophozytes and merozytes as they were in malaria. And they are seen in the RBCs. And as the, the spleen has a great role to play in, the, um, in, in combating the uh, infections in the body, especially uh, those organisms which go into the systems. Spleen comes in the way of the passage of blood, and as the blood passes through the spleen, the spleen removes most of the harmful organisms, including parasites, including bacteria, etc., etc. So if the, the spleen is compromised, then those people, those patients will be having a very high risk of, uh, of this infection, of the fatality of this infection. It's a gradual onset and takes a few weeks to, to, you know, to manifest completely. Initial symptoms are flu-like. What are flu-like symptoms? Fever. Fever. Fever, headache, malaise, body pains, some little bit of cough. All these are called flu-like symptoms. And then you can, if you examine, there would be anemia and there would be an enlargement of spleen and, and liver. Then you make a blood, stain, blood smear and you stain it and you see the intraerythrocytic ring shape. It is very important. You had a lecture on malaria? Yes. When you're diagnosing these infections, it is important to see the rings inside the RBCs. Inside the RBCs. Outside the RBCs, yes, but the confirmatory or the diagnostic feature is the presence of these rings inside the RBCs. <coughs> they are arranged in the form of tetrads. Tetrads means four. four. They are arranged in the form of four a special sort of an arrangement which is uh, uh, which is known as Maltese cross. I don't know exactly what this Maltese cross means, but it means that I'll show you the picture. Maybe you can understand from the picture. Now, how do they differ from the malaria parasite? Number one is that they don't have the exorithistic phase. You know what is the exorithistic phase? In the liver. Yes, in the liver. The phase in the liver. Malaria parasite, when it enters the body, it is immediately cleared up by the liver cells as the blood passes through the liver. All the, uh, which form enters the, uh, the body? Which form of the malaria parasite? Sporozoid. The sporozoid. The sporozoid enters into the body and as it comes into the blood and as it, the blood passes through the liver, all the sporozoids are taken up by the liver cells and they form the liver merozoids. <clears throat> they run one or two cycles within the liver and then they come out into the uh, blood and then they get into the RBCs. But in this, there is no liver form. No pigments in the erythrocytes does not pro produce pigments in the erythrocytes as the presence of plasmodium does. And then ring tetrates. Remember, there are no ring tetrates in malaria. Maximum number of the uh, uh, ring forms that you can have is usually two. I don't know, sometimes three, I don't know. But we have not seen two. Uh, we have not seen three, two, two ring forms. And that two ring forms are usually seen in? Malaria. Which one? Falciparum. In falciparum. It is usually seen in falciparum because the rings of falciparum are smaller. They're smaller, they're delicate. They're very delicate, where the rings of the Others are rough, tough, and they are stronger and bigger. Four rings. And the rings are different also. They are not typically signet-shaped rings. Mm. You know what are signet-shaped rings? Yes. Mm -hmm. They are not exactly signet-shaped rings. This is what is the Maltese ring. And look at this picture again, here. This is like that Maltese ring. So here there are more than four, huh? But the four tetrads is the diagnostic feature. 
These are the drugs which are used. Exchange transfusion is something which will be used in extreme cases, extreme emergencies, and where there's a lot of hemolysis, and so much of hemolysis, that the degree of uh, <coughs> loss of the RBGs is so great that it is, it is below the minimum requirement for carrying the oxygen from the lungs. So in that case, you need to have an exchange transfusion done because the exchange transfusion has its own problems. In exchange transfusion, you are replacing most of the blood and the patient is being exposed to immunological reactions. Prevention is very simple. You should avoid the ticks. The first thing is that you should try to remain within your limits. You should not go to areas where there's a lot of prevalence of these ticks in the jungle. And if the ticks have come on you, if they are biting you and if they have, because the ticks are such that they're just, they're not like mosquitoes that they bite and they go away. They would bite, like to bite and stick mm. in order to have more, more meat. So once the ticks, you're exposed to the ticks, the ticks are there, they're stuck on your, on your legs, on your you know, hands, etc. So if you can find them, you try to remove them because more consistently they will bite, the more chances are that they can transmit this infection. So that was all about this uh, Babesia, and we are going to talk about now about the dengue and rabbit fever. Dengue, I think about 15 years back, was a localized disease. But now from the last 15 to 20 years, it is involving, slowly spreading out over, out over to the globe. It's involving most of the countries. Most of these diseases were localized, geographically localized. They had typical geographical areas where this was prevalent. But now they are spreading out into the world. So what is the reason? Maybe? Uh, travel a lot, maybe. Yeah, traveling, yeah. traveling, and uh, rapid traveling. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, we have faster ships, you have airplanes. In the morning, you are here, in the evening, you are somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And, you know, airplanes and these ships, they only don't only carry the, um, you know, the, the human beings as passengers. They have mosquitoes also as passengers. And they have other things also, ticks, etc. Whatever is available. Whosoever wants to go to USA can sit in the you know, airplane mm. and move on. Even the rats can do that. So initially it was found in very localized regions. Now it is there in quite a big area of the tropics and subtropics. And this area extends to the, from the Indonesia Archipelago. What is this? This is a extensive group of islands. Yeah, this is a, yeah, this is a triangle, which is you know, geographical triangle, which includes other countries and, and you know, the, uh, islands of Indonesia, along with Australia, South and Central America, Southeast Asia, and even Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is a large bulk of the uh, population which is under the attack of this dengue virus spinning some of the, I think, northern part of the Europe. Most infections present with fever, headache, pain, etc., and they just go on. They just go off. The countries in which the disease is there, it is considered in the differential diagnosis of fevers, and you just manage it symptomatically, and in three, four days, it is gone. But sometimes it gets severe. That is the problem which we, we are fearing. Two things can happen. One is that the, the severe form of dengue fever, and that severe form of dengue fever becomes severe when there's a lot of immune uh, processes going on, leading to increased vascular permeability, movement of the <clears throat> fluid from the extravascular space into the organs, resulting in hypoxia, hypovolemia, shock, etc. in the severe cases. So that condition is known as dengue hemorrhagic shock. The second uh, condition which is severe is the dengue hemorrhagic fever. It is part of the 
hemorrhagic fevers, but not every case ends up in, in hemorrhages. There could be some bleeding diathesis like purpura or like, you know, ecchymosis, a little bit in severe cases of dengue, but usually there's no frank hemorrhages. But there can be frank hemorrhages, and that <clears throat> happens when one, uh, when a person having antibodies against one serotype is infected with the second serotype, right? Immune with the first serotype, fine. All the other serotypes have only partial immunity, which means that the antibodies can recognize, but they, they, they can't, they don't have the ability to eradicate the, uh, the virus. Now, this second type of condition is, is, is severe and it produces dengue hemorrhagic fever. So, all that bluff, it's an arbo virus, it has four serotypes, one, two, three, and four, belongs to Fadevi viridi, it's a positive sense, RNA, enveloped virus. This is what I just told you, that one serotype infection confers complete immunity to the same serotype, but partial to the other serotypes. Outbreaks often start during the rainy season. Obviously, because that is when the mosquito uh, breeds in, in, in large numbers. The mosquito is Aedes aegypti, and which is the mosquito in the malaria? Uh, Anopheles. Now, please be careful with the, with the spellings. I was checking your SAQs, and I am really scared. You know, I. <laughs> I I could make out, but most of you, I could make out with the spellings. I mean, Y and E instead of U and, but I could make out from the sound. But try to, you know, now you are an MD2. So try to improve upon this aspect also. Now, uh, Aedes aegypti has a particular habit of breeding, of laying eggs in clean water. Whereas the mosquito of malaria would lay eggs in contaminated stagnant water, yes, mm. brackish, stagnant old waters. So Aedes aegypti has a more likelihood of spreading in the cities where there is most of the things are clean, and uh, it doesn't require much of the water. Even if you have this uh, flower pots and you have flower pots in your houses and you water the plants and you leave some water standing over there. The mosquito can come and lay eggs over there also. So, now, in, even in the hospitals, people have stopped, banned, taking flowers for the patients, because once they take the flowers, they put into a pot and they put some water into it to keep the flowers going on for a couple of days. So even that pot containing water can lead to the breeding of these mosquitoes. Now, it is the female mosquito, Aedes aegypti, which is responsible for the transmission of disease. It is the female Anopheles mosquito, which is responsible for the transmission of malaria. Why is it so? Because eggs, it's eggs need the iron from... Eggs need what? Iron from the blood. Iron. Because iron is required for ovulation, for reproduction. So they smell this iron. In, in the bodies of animals and men, and it's, it's an easy source. Another important thing is that once a mosquito is infected, that mosquito will remain infected for life. So it's a permanent source. And there is evidence that there is also a trans-ovarian spread of this virus from the mother into the eggs and from the eggs onwards into the new individuals. 100 million cases, half a million cases of Demrig worldwide. 
annually 100 million cases of dengue fever, half a million cases of dengue hemorrhagic fever. So half. Half. I don't think so. No. But maybe this is more prevalent in those countries where both the serotypes are present. But what we have seen in, in our countries, in Pakistan, hemorrhagic fever because of dengue is less. It's not 50%. Here it is 50%. Maybe no, it is more. Not. Maybe we have just one. Huh? It's not. 100 million. 100 million, half a million. Yes. Yeah, but half, yeah, it is not 50%. That's, you're right. But even, you know, half a million is a lot of cases. Uh, it's the re-emergent disease. What do you mean by re-emergent? Yeah, it has come again. It used to be there, but now it has re-emerged again. With increasing urbanization, poverty, intercontinental, air travel, and the demise of Aedes mosquito eradication program. Mosquito eradication programs were taken up by WHO very, very enthusiastically. And a lot of money was poured into it, and a lot of people were employed, and they used to spray these insecticides into the uh, you know, trees and habitats in order to kill the mosquitoes. But for quite some years, these programs have been suspended. They have been suspended because of two things. One is that the, these insecticides, they were quite powerful and they used to settle down in the vegetation. And that you know, became a potential risk to the human beings. And the second was that the mosquitoes were getting resistant. Yeah. just like bacteria. So the programs were not giving the desired results which were, they were supposed to give. Now this is the life cycle, human to human, dengue to dengue, right? So there is a trans ovarian you know, connection also, and this is quite a source of... Doctor, what do what you mean? Huh? What do you mean trans ovarian? Transovarian means that a female mosquito is infected, right? Yes. And she will remain infected throughout her life once she gets infected. Okay. Whenever she will lay eggs, she will pass the virus to that, uh, into the eggs and from there to the next generation of mosquitoes. Once the mosquito bites, the virus goes into the local lymph nodes, replicates over there, stays there for two to three days, and then disseminates through the blood into the other tissues. Now, it infects the monocytes, macrophages in great numbers, in great quantities, and then to a little extent, B cells and T cells also. Here the replication is abundant, much, in greater numbers. Then it can also infect the skin and the lymphoid tissue, other lymphoid tissue, and the macrophages also, the tissue macrophages, that is what it means here. The tissue macrophages, and it can replicate in them also, producing some skin rash also in, in some cases. When the patient will come to you, he will have viremia. He will be viremic as long as there is fever. And once the fever settles, defervescent means once the fever, fever settles, the virus also is cleared from the blood, whether it is still present in some of the organs or not, but it is cleared from the blood. The symptomatology is because of the immune response. There is fever and there is a lot of myalgia, a lot of muscle pain, extraordinary muscle pain, <clears throat> along with pain in the bones. And previously, because of this symptom, it was known as break bone, fever. break bone fever also. It was called break bone fever as if the bones have <clears throat> broken down. Now the This break bone fever and the pain in the bones is because of the involvement and infection of the elements of the bone marrow, including these cells. 
But this in effect in, to the bone marrow will lead to local suppression of all these series for the first four to five days. And the patient will have cytopenia. If you do a blood CP, complete picture, or CBC, whatever you call it, you will find that all elements of the um, all elements in the blood will be suppressed, like aplastic anemia, but not aplastic anemia, because aplastic anemia is a is a major suppression. It's not like that, but they are suppressed. All right. Explain to you in the introduction, the dengue shock syndrome occurs in those percentage of people in which there is extraposition of plasma into the extravascular sites, which may be into the pleural cavity, which may be into the uh, what is this called? Mm. Peritoneal cavity, which may be into the peritoneal cavity and into the uh, pleural cavity as the fever is subsiding. So at the end of the disease, apparent, apparently one considers that once the fever is settling down, the disease is ending. But this is the point where the person can go into shock because of this movement of fluid. It's always, or sometimes? Sometimes. It's not always. And uh, along with this movement of fluids, the platelets also, they leave. And it results in, uh, you know, a fall in platelet in the peripheral blood. And this fall in the platelet does happen in, in this uh, in dengue. And the uh, untrained uh, medical staff will start transfusing platelets without any, um, you know, other evidence. So this platelet deficiency is not an actual platelet deficiency. However, actual platelet deficiency can occur in dengue hemorrhagic fever, but this is not actual platelet deficiency in the earlier stages. It's just because of the movement of platelets. And once the fluid comes back, the platelets, they come back. This is the time when fluid and electrolyte maintenance of the patient is extremely important. Now, this is because of the immune activation. Now, increased levels of interferon gamma and interleukin-8, other mediators, they affect the local endothelial vessels and they bring about the vasodilation and even the endothelial cell death. In addition, the immune complexes also activate the complement system, which lead to increased production of C3A and C5A. So what is the action of C3A and C5A? Uh, that is C3B. Attract uh, neutrophils and others. Yes, they can. Chemotractin. Uh, Complement. Vasodilation. Mm -hmm. They cause vasodilation, increased capillary permeability, and vasodilation both. Dengue hemorrhagic fever occurs in people who are infected with one serotype previously, they get okay, and they are immune against that serotype, but if they get infected with another serotype, there are chances that they are going to have this dengue hemorrhagic fever. Now, why this happens? This happens because the first exposure to one serotype gives only the partial immunity against the other serotype, not the complete immunity. And the concept of immune enhancement, immune enhancement is, is uh, you know, uh, uh, said to be responsible for this. Immune enhancement is, that uh, it is said that in all those cells which have receptors for the FC portion of the antibodies, the virus 
of the second serotype is recognized by the antibodies. They pick up the virus and they put it into the <coughs> into the cells with the FC receptors. You know, the antibody has two two sites. One is the FC and the other is the FAB. So the FAB binds the antigen and FC binds the receptor on the cell. So these antibodies, they take up the virus and they put it into the cell. Now inside the cell, what exactly the reason is, there is not, in, uh, uh, not enough potential to destroy the virus. Or there is an excessive immune response produced as a result of the presence of virus inside the cells. And this excessive immune response produces dengue hemorrhagic fever. This is called immune enhancement. Don't get scared with this picture. It is just to brighten up your lecture, just for your entertainment, colored picture. And uh, it explains what we have already talked about, right? The virus getting into the cells and increasing the inflammatory mediators. And these inflammatory mediators acting upon the uh, vessels and producing these effects. Now, incubation period is not very long. It is relatively shorter, 5 to 11 days. And uh, non-specific, fever, headache, chills. Fever is high grade. Fever is high grade and there is headache. Headache is quite pronounced. And the patient will tell you that the main pain that he or she is feeling is behind the eyes. Pre-orbital, pre-orbital headache. And there is pain in the joints and pain in the muscles, etc., etc. In more than half the cases, there is rash also. Macular, papillar, rash. And this rash contains the, the virus. Fever will last about five days, and then there is a recovery. Or very rarely, a second fever may occur after three days, later associated with dengue hemorrhagic fever. But usually, in most of the cases, the fever passes on in about Five days, maybe Doctor? a week. Yes. Then, uh, is it transmitted from human to human? Yeah. What do you think? What do you think? No. No. Why? Yeah. No. The bite is real. It is not transmitted from human to human. No case so far has been reported which has been which has occurred from one human being to another human. They say that there is something that the, that the virus has to pass through the mosquito. There's something in the life cycle in which the virus has to pass through the mosquito and then into the human being to produce disease. Human to human transmission has so far not been reported. Maybe you can pick up the blood of one person and put it into another person. Maybe, maybe it can produce disease. But naturally, no such case has been reported. So severe cases, you have hypotension, pleural, and peritoneal effusions. Echimosis, you know what is echimosis? <clears throat> hemorrhagic spots. Blackish hemorrhagic spots. Circulatory shock, DIC, etc., etc. This is a, a way, a method, rough method to find out whether uh, you, the patient has increased vascular permeability or not, whether there's a tendency of the patient to bleed. So this is done is by putting up a tonic mm. or a blood pressure uh, cuff on, on the forearm, uh, sorry, on the upper arm, and you inflate it, right? You inflate it, and after inflation, if small reddish spots appear in the forearm, which means that the person has the tendency to uh, WHO has established these four criteria to find out whether the person is really, really suffering from uh, dengue or not. One is the fever or recent history of acute fever, hemorrhagic manifestations, low platelet count, evidence of leaky capillaries, capillaries which are leaking, capillaries which are losing the, the fluid. 
So how would you find out that the buildings are leaking? This is by finding out the hematocrit and low albumin level, or if there is some other effusion, pleural or peritoneal effusion. Fever, hemorrhagic manifestations, platelet count, and what is the normal platelet count? Uh, for the for the four hundred thousand to one lakh fifty thousand to four lakh fifty thousand is the normal platelet count. So when is the platelet level alarming? When it's below. 100,000. 100, 100, when it is below 100,000. Then it is extremely alarming. When it's above 550,000. When it falls to 50,000, mm -hmm. 50, it is extremely alarming. Any time the patient can go into a very severe bleed. So 100,000, you need to do something. But at 50,000, you need to do a lot of things. Hematocrit, what is hematocrit? Red the blood cells. The whole blood. RBC to the whole blood. The volume of the RBC, yes. Packed cell volume. How do you do? Have you done this in your physiology class? Yes. Okay, good. So packed cell volume is an indication of how much uh, RBCs you have in blood. So this is an indication, indirect indication of hemolysis. If hematocrit is low, that means that you are losing the RBCs. Yes. Low albumin? Leakage. Yes. Albumin is the main plasma protein present, and it moves with the plasma very effectively. Pleural or other effusions, how will you find out whether there's a pleural effusion? X-ray. X-ray and physical examination. Physical examination first, and then X-rays. Now, how would you diagnose a case of dengue fever? Based Clinically, on yes. You need to have a good history. You need to have uh, knowledge of uh, the Take epidemiology, the whether the dengue is present in that region or not. You need to take a very careful history of tick bites. Tick bites and tick bites. If the person had been a traveler. Mosquito, yeah. Mosquito. And travel history, yes. You need to take the recent travel history. So after that, you do a blood complete picture. The blood complete picture will show that despite the high grade fever, at least it will show that there is no gross rise of platelets. Uh, RBCs. WBCs. Acute bacterial infections will give you a oh. leukocytosis. And that leukocytosis is mainly polymorph leukocytosis. You will see that there is no, at least there is no rise in WBC count. There may be a decrease in WBC count. And there may be a decrease in all the elements of the blood. And then you will do further investigations to find out. Now, in the further investigations, the most important in the early phase of the disease, within the first five to seven days, is testing for NS1 protein. This NS1 protein is a part of the virus, and its detection almost confirms the presence of dengue. But this is, test is extremely valid, extremely sensitive if you do it within five, five days or maximum seven days. As you move on, the sensitivity falls because then the NS1 protein is cleared from the blood. If you get a patient after one week, it is better to do a IgM, dengue IgM testing. So NS1 protein in the early phases and IgM in the later phase. Now, if you do an IgG, for this IgG, 
you need to have, you need to do a paired sira. You know what is a paired sira? One at the time of presentation and one, let us say, after two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. And if this shows you a four-fold rise, then this is a confirmatory test for a recent Levy virus infection. It does not pinpoint dengue. Mm. It shows that the person has been infected with a Levy virus. This graph shows you that the, the first, earlier on, no, yes, one more thing. When you look at these slides, you will again get confused. Uh, virus isolation culture can be done during the first few days. And PCR can be used to detect the viral nuclear nucleic acid in the first few days, along with MS1. But PCR, viral isolation, they are uh, difficult to perform tests, complicated, need expertise. MS1 protein can be done. I mean, it's not, it's not much of a problem. You can do it by ELISA. You can find it very easily. So the in routine clinical practice, PCRs and uh, viral culture. Viral culture is never done in routine clinical practice for diagnosis. It is usually for confirmation, research, or you know other purposes. PCR you can do because PCR methods have been developed very well now, and you can even get rapid results in about six to eight hours. But still, it requires equipment, requires expertise, requires a special environment to conduct a good PCR. MS1 is easy to do, and it has the same value as the PCR. <clears throat> now, this is a chart which is showing you these different type of investigations, their uh, value, time, what specimen you need, when are you going to collect the uh, sample, and what diseases are required. There is no specific drug to manage dengue. The treatment is symptomatic. You need to give symptomatic treatment like antipyretics, analgesics to the patient to make the patient comfortable, reassurance to the patient, rest to the patient, fluids, good diet, good food, and depending upon how the disease progresses, you need to further give him the care. Like, if the disease is milder, you can keep it at home. There's no need to hospitalize, but if you think that going into this dengue shock, blood pressure is falling, or there is some evidence of pleural or peritoneal infusions, or there is albumin is low, or platelets are less and less and less. You can hospitalize. Must rather you must hospitalize patients and manage body. The investigations and sign and symptoms become very important if you examine the patient and do the investigation serially. That will give you an idea whether the patient is improving, whether it is stable, or whether it is deteriorating. Now, for example, if you have a platelet count of 150 at, at the start, and then after five days you get 100, and then another three days you get 80. So this is significant. So you need to do something. Similarly, in the case of the algorithm. So one single investigation may not give you that evidence about the progress of the patient, whereas a serial investigation will give you that idea. Mosquito control, personal protective measures, no vaccine is available so far. So how can you control mosquitoes? Tents. Sleeping in tents? Or having those, you know, electric Are retracted, and I don't know whether there are some for mosquitoes or not. Then spraying 
then not leaving, not leaving exposed water, you know, not leaving exposed fresh water. When you water the plants, you should not leave the water standing. It's better to spray and finish off. You know, they say that this dengue, uh, the spread of dengue between different geogra geogra geographical areas was mainly due to the tire trade. You know what are tires? How many of you drive cars? All of us. All of us. One, two. All of us. All of you? Yes. yes. All of you? Yes. And you don't know what are tires? <laughs> no. The tires on which you <laughs> okay. come to the car. The tires, the old, the trade for old tires. You know, when you change the tires of your car, yeah. you give the old tire to the, to the person of whom you buy the new tire. And you're very happy that he gives you about 200, 250 yards. You know? What do you call that? The base. Yeah, the original tire is costing you uh, 1,000 rials or 800. He will charge you 200 less. Okay. Now, those tires mm -hmm. are sent back to the manufacturer. And the manufacturer then re the rubber and it produces new tires after a you know, process. Mm -hmm. Now, these tires are usually transported on ships. And the ships go from one harbor to another, and they download. For example, ships coming from Saudi Arabia will go to Sri Lanka, maybe, and will dump the cargo. They will you know, up, offload the tires, and they will be placed somewhere there. And then ships from Pakistan will come, ships from India will come, ships from Bahrain, other country. They will dump their tires over there. So now tires are something which, you know, you don't need. <clears throat> to preserve them. You don't need a shed or you don't need an environment. You just, they just used to throw them out in the open. And what would happen? There would be rain and the tires are hollow inside. The water collects mm -hmm. in those. And the mosquito lays the eggs. And then the next ship comes and picks up the children of the mosquito mm -hmm. and transports them to another country. So free transportation of mosquitoes from one country to another. So this old tire trade was also responsible for the spread of things. Any questions so far? No. No, I don't have any questions. And uh, Doctor, in slide 25. In slide 25, please. Slide 25. That's what is it in slide uh, there is last point. Uh, he told us a uh, fourfold. Wait or, a minute. Okay. Tell me when I'm there. Yeah, okay. Here? No. Here? No. Here? Yes. Yes. Uh, the last point a fourfold or greater increase antibody level measured by HEG. In the note, we are take it from this slide. It's told us AGM antibody. It can manifest for other uh, falbin virus infection. Mm -hmm. AGM or IgG? Let me. There are three things that I talked about in this slide. One was NS1 protein, NS1 protein, second was IgM, and the third was IgG. So NS1 protein is the diagnostic marker in the first week, and IgM antibodies are diagnostic markers in the, uh, after, the, after the first week. Okay. So IgG. If you do an IgG, let us say in the first week, on the second week, and you get a titer of let us say one by 80, and then you repeat this after four weeks during the convalescent period, and if you get a titer of four times 80, what is four times 80? 80, 160, 320, and 640. So if you get a 640 titer minimum, that shows that this person has been infected with a flavi virus. Other, other, uh, Could be no. other zones. It's not diagnostic, 
particularly for dengue. It will show you that the person has been infected with flavivirus. Dengue is a flavivirus, so it just gives you a broad, uh, a broad evidence. What about IgM? IgM is particular for dengue. It is called dengue IgM. If the IgM is positive, yeah, okay. then it means that this is a dengue infection. Okay. It's not non-specific. IgM is specific for dengue. Doctor, Sometimes you get confused because of these IgGs and you know, in, in some disease it is confirmatory, in the others it is not. So why this is, this is because it depends on the, on the methodology available for testing. Maybe there's an IgG which can confirm this, this dengue, but we don't have the capability of detecting that IgG in the labs. So what we are talking here is what is, is actually done. It's not what is actually being, is, is what is actually is happening in the body, right? So what we are talking about is what is the capability, what we can do. Okay, doctor, in uh, slide 27 at the table, what's we... What is 27? A table for a test. This one? This. Yes. What is the most important in it? Everything. <laughs> <And> <laughs> Everything and nothing. Everything and nothing? Important is what we have discussed. Okay. 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 Right? Okay. What what have have is important. Mm. Okay. Mm. Mr. Marker.